hello. Um, my name is uh, Michael, uh, but my real name is kind of for Yang. And today I'm going to talk about uh, how the experience is like for us to run FreeBSD containers in production, um, more specifically on AWS. And I want to go through like the uh, tooling side of it, like what are the existing stuff, and some fun stuff uh, about FreeBSD containers uh, versus what you have uh, on Linux, and there's some advantage and disadvantages. So me personally, uh, I'm a FreeBSD user for about uh, six to eight years. I also uh, submitted some patch. Uh, I have my background is in mathematics. That naturally make me a more functional programming person with uh, Scala and Haskell, and thought that also affect how I look, the way I look at container, and what I think container really should do. Uh, I also do some system programming with C, C++, and Rust, uh, mainly on FreeBSD. Uh, I'm currently working in a live streaming company uh, in San Francisco, based in San Francisco. Uh, basically, what we do is do some live streaming stuff plus e-commerce. So it's, it's kind of like a TV shopping, but on steroids. Um, I turns out to be the backend engineers who also need to do all the DevOps stuff and basically everything else except the front end. So um, that means there's a lot of workload, but it also means I can be more free in terms of picking what technology uh, we use and everything. And we pick a FreeBSD uh, running on uh, AWS. Originally, it's actually just because, okay, I'm more familiar, familiar with this. We need to get this up super quick and let's stick with a FreeBSD. But later, we actually ha have think of, okay, should we do Linux and should we do Docker and try out different stuff? Um, it's funny because our application is mostly written in Scala. Some of uh, it is Go. So in terms of like performance or in terms of like um, deployment, everything, it, it doesn't really make a huge difference between different operating systems. Uh, it also means we don't really have any uh, problem usually um, okay, system we have, for example, dependency hell, anything like that. We basically have nothing. So we are pretty um, happy, and we just design auto switch. Plus, uh, we well, I I love DJ so much. So this is why we stick with FreeBSD. But um, until some point, when you start to have more services, and you start to have some CI/CD pipelines, all of a sudden it is quite important uh, for us to say, this thing is becoming kind of painful, so how are we going to accelerate the CI-CD process? And the idea is just, okay, um, well, container, because a container is kind of like this thing, okay, you can build a container, and then you can use, uh, restore a container state from a server snapshot, so you can use existing real data from your database to do a lot of CI CD stuff because you want the thing you're building work with real data and you want to make sure things like uh, migration, everything works. Now, this is what Google thinks about container, right? It's like, okay, those are just like lightweight packages and put together somewhere else. But if you think about it, that sounds pretty wrong because by this definition, a true root is a container. And by this definition, a spinning disk with uh, no capability of uh, executing anything will also be a container. So there's a lot of things missing from here. Uh, so how we define container is, to me, a container is like an environmental context or like ex execution context. It controls how the process uh, in an operating system C is resources, or C is privilege domain. So for example, um, the, one of the most obvious one is file system, okay? Um, this is how the process in this container, that means a uh, um, environmental context, is able to find its share libraries, is, is able to find its executable. But it also includes things like networks, right? Program usually cannot run with just files. Uh, if you put it in like a um, central pro program point of view, is that uh, a computation is kind of useless if you, if you can never have si uh, side effects. So it also, so network is like one of the um, 
more trivial way to think about it. There's some states that is actually not in the file system, but like it is part of a container, right? And uh, sysfile IPC, if you guys have run uh, Postgres in uh, uh, jail, then you know sysfile IPC is something that you don't expose uh, in a file system level. It's absolutely everything about the state of a container because that is shared memory, that's message queues. And more importantly, are privileges like, okay, can I mount something? Or can I open a routing socket? Or can I just, you know, uh, use wall socket? Those are, these, all these things combined is, in my point of view, what a container should be. Because this is, if you look at container as a monad from a functional programming perspective, this, enti this entire thing is a box that boxing your computation such that you can get some result out of it. Um, well, I kind of mentioned about it before. So why uh, we start to use a container when we were kind of perfectly fine? The biggest reason was uh, CI and CD. And also there were some members is they actually cannot uh, access AWS because they live uh, in a country that actually blocks the internet. I think you guys know which one is it? Yes. And the second thing is that when you start to run services uh, on cloud, the one way you do it is that you just spin up some EC2 instance and each one runs some, some kind of service. But that's, uh, that starts to get expensive and you are having services that maybe it's running most of the time, but it's not really, it doesn't really need all the resources all the time. And then the idea is that, okay, so how can we uh, make the scalability better? So how can we scale up and scale down and then scale up by each uh, service and everything like that. And once you do that, it brings another issue, which is that, okay, if I'm gonna use DTrace, if I'm gonna use any kind of uh, observability tools, there are so many servers happening and so many servers running, uh, how are we gonna deal with that? Well, this is one thing really good uh, in FreeBSD, but something is kind of lacking in Linux, surprisingly, because Linux does not really have a primitive core uh, container or like something like gel. In order to trace, uh, use PPPF trace, for example, you're actually going through a lot of garbage just trying to find the, what your process is actually doing and how it interact with the rest of the system. But when you put this thing into a gel and you run dtrace, all of a sudden, because you get the JID back, so you know how the, the process in this execution context is interacting with uh, other processes, maybe even out of the same node, and how they interact together, especially when uh, we have a DWatch, which is much better than uh, just DTrace. DTrace is amazing, you can do so many things with it, but DWatch will save you so much work in terms of like, scripting. Uh, the last thing is uh, privilege, uh, privilege management. This one is more trivial for us BSD user to see a uh, container because gel originally, the paper says, is developed specifically to uh, manage privilege and um, users better than a traditional Unix system by introducing this namespace in between them. And we also happen to have some users that they just don't, uh, well, not users, actually developers, that they just don't have anything at home that can really resemble like the development environment. So it's not just like the application containers that we're running, we're also running some traditional gels just to say, hey, this is your environment. I know you really suck at sysadmin, but don't worry about it. Just build and run your code inside. Like you can't even see anything outside of the network. Um, container on different uh, OS, uh, conceptually this thing, same thing, but the implementation is very different. Uh, the reason why is every OS works a little bit differently. In FreeBSD, uh, if we go back to the definition of like a uh, environmental context and execution context, in FreeBSD, it means that uh, the root file system of the jail, uh, the DevFS rule set, and I'm actually surprised uh, how frequent the DevFS rule set is actually being overlooked by all um, jail orchestration system, uh, mainly because it's, you're either running an application or something that you don't need DevFS, but DevFS is everything about the state of your kernel interface and something you can access from the user land. So if you want to use a tab interface, you want to use a like null terminal, especially if you run behind inside, you absolutely need something that uh, can manage the DevFS, a rule set, 
And even worse, it's kind of bad to have the deficit rules that always steadily defined in the whole system because now you have this very inf um, flexible uh, architecture that every time when you want to run a new container that requires some really special DFS rule set, you need to go back and change every uh, host node. So it's kind of defeating the point. Uh, the other uh, uh, gel parameters, obviously, uh, like in Postgres, System 5 message queues, shared memories, and a bunch of syscontrol which actually determine if your gel can route traffic, right? The, those are all the state about uh, a container on FreeBSD. This is like what you actually have to think of when you're building something to say, okay, I have a container, like how do I get most of it? You need to think of uh, every one of it. And FreeBSD included some uh, base tools and utilities uh, to manage gel. Uh, Manfree gel actually is the libgel interface. So it's like uh, libc. Uh, routines that allows you to uh, run your gel. Well, the way it works is literally that your process enter a gel, and then you can set the uh, gel parameters uh, by ID or by name. Uh, but most uh, previous user and system me are more familiar with is the gel command. But the gel command itself is actually just a wrapper around like uh, the lib gel. So uh, you cannot actually reliably use uh, the gel command to do your lifecycle management. The reason why, despite you have gel config in your system and it say what it's supposed to do when it stop, that thing actually will never run if you don't stop it using the gel command. Because it's actually what it does is say, okay, gel, uh, gel dash, dash out, that's, that means we move the gel, and then actually pass the gel config again and to see what kind of routine should it run. And that's how it does the uh, lifecycle management but it also means that for whatever reason your gel dies, which can happen because uh, the default behavior of a gel is that it will die as soon as there's no process in the container. So you actually cannot capture rigorously uh, the life cycle of a gel. Um, there are many, many uh, existing utilities uh, to manage gel and to try to do some uh, orchestration on gels. Um, the Rendry is like the newer one, it's used to more like uh, if you try to run some uh, OCI compatible um, container. Basically you say, okay, this is a process and you run it as this UID and this is how we define the image. Uh, I personally haven't used it in production or tried it, so I'm not going to include that uh, in my next slides, but master IO cage and port are currently some of the most used ones. Um, IO cage is probably a little bit older and more people are familiar with it. It's probably like also the default uh, recommender way uh, in Michael Lucas' books. Um, but the IO cage is really, for that matter, IO cage and Bastel really meant to manage um, faithful gels. That means you actually use it almost like a VM and you allow yourself to constantly change its own. Uh, I would say it's on state because functional programming wise, you are literally, it's like running recursive and try changing, changing your file system. To me, it, it just like changing your parameters uh, as a function. Um, and port is really great. Uh, look at up there. Um, port is awesome because it allows you to do everything you expect uh, Docker's uh, available to do. So you can say, okay, I want to uh, build an image uh, set of as you can distribute it. And it has, oh, actually, it should switch slides. Yes, and it can do all kinds of stuff, but let's focus on Bastel first. Um, the good thing about Bastel is that setFS is totally optional. You can run it on UFS. That's kind of great because setFS, um, you have to, oh, running on AWS, you have to tune down the ALC a little bit. Uh, you don't want it, uh, the ALC to consume most of the memory. In that regard, Bastel is great. And also a Bastel file basically is almost like a Docker file and then you apply uh, this kind, it basically it's like a shell script almost. In, in fact, it is a wrapper uh, of shell script. Basically you say, okay, um, from point A to point B, what do I need to do? And what, what kind of search, search I need to do to this uh, gel in order to, uh, for it to run a certain way. And it's very maintainable. It's, it's crazy because uh, one thing less that people know is that you cannot use uh, NoFS or UnionFS mount point as a gel root. 
right? And the balance card uh, basically overcome this problem by making uh, by mounting the um, base system inside a dot file dot directory, and then uh, use symlink and then so symlink back to the base system. So this way is also help with the maintainment a lot because if you want to update a base system of like a group of jails, you just do that. You just like make changes to that um, base system. And because everything is symlinked, uh, the upgrade just like complete like really nicely and you use so much less uh, file system space, they're symlinked, even without set of apps. Um, but there are some problems. Also, does not know containers that you created, but they're not started. So if you have created some container previously, and they die or you killed it, and you say a bus tell this again, bus does not know if it's there. You base the way you do it is that you ls bus tells uh, on directory to figure out what kind of gel is already there. Uh, the, the gels are also like a uh, state preserving, so they kind of like. It's still like your traditional gel. It's the soft fit the uh, use in, on the cloud as like an application um, there because you, you actually don't want them to preserve uh, anything uh, as possible. So that's that is kind of out of the question. Uh, the next one is IO cage. Um, this basic QL, like it requires that of us. It's like if I need to run it on a really small thing on EC2 or Whatever, I either have to build this uh, FreeBSD custom image myself using service or root, or what else can I do? It's like, okay, I can attach a volume and then basically format that as a set of apps and create a C pool on it. But that's a tremendous amount of work and it's not really automatable, right? Uh, the templates are great. I really like the part that our cache templates are declarative. So you can pass it with standard tooth, you can use it just straight on. So you, you know what kind of behavior uh, is going on, and you can tell even a job stop, it, it knows it's there at least, right? So you won't have to say, okay, I want to list like what kind of containers that are alive. If I cannot see that one, then it, it's kind of crazy. Again, port does everything, and by default has orchestration with Nomad. So it's kind of replacing the role of uh, Kubernetes, and it's also a little, well, a lot more thing than Kubernetes. Basically, whatever you want to do, you can accomplish uh, with port the interface nice. I know it's using production, is it? No? Yeah, it's not using production. <laughs> but again, it requires that of us. So it's like, <clears throat> um, that's why we're actually using none of them. Uh, we have our custom build things. <laughs> yes. Um, CellFS on which is not yet there. I think there's some uh, MakeFS uh, worked on CellFS, so maybe later it, it could be a thing. But as a functional programmer and uh, have a math background, it is so important to me, I feel like, the way a container is built to have a manifest that's declarative and tells you what it is. And for that matter, I also want like an image registry. That means the way that we do it is just make it as compliant to like the OCI as possible. So you just reuse all the uh, functionalities there. And we also discovered something really funny. You can actually have a jails uh, with our system over NFS. So that means you can actually run semi headless uh, nodes. Um, but it's a container. So that, that's actually really awesome. Um, I'm, go I'm going to go through that later. So now when I decide this interface, right, the thing say, okay, I have this manifest and what really you should do, like what is the correct behavior and semantics of a container? The first thing is, obviously, the whole point is that you need to distribute it, right? You need to have a registry, that's just like a must. But unlike other tools, like how they treat containers and for especially Bastel, I don't think by default you should always consider a container image or manifest, it, it, sh it shouldn't be considered trust. You may be getting it from somewhere else, you may be getting it from your colleagues, but you don't know what is actually going on there. You don't want to say, okay, blast that file, redirect, and then you just put that on like a PF. That sounds kind of crazy to me. For me, I, I feel like if the operator should have control to say, these are the policy I allow my containers to run. 
these are the uh, privileged domain that I trust I'm okay with it. And if the uh, container is, is violating that, it should not be run by default. It should be uh, override. Yeah, you should allow the operator to override it, but it just, the privilege should be ground because they are foreign stuff. It's like you don't know where you're getting from, especially when it's, you know, downloaded. Um, so we designed the uh, image file. I hope I can open source it uh, in the next couple of months, still fixing something. Originally, it's written in all Haskell, but now it's becoming worse because it turns out not many people understand Haskell. <laughs> yes. So the file system layers, which are the main state um, of any containers, basically. It, it doesn't matter if it's Windows, uh, Solaris, or Linux. File system is always the biggest thing. So but the nice thing is OCI has its own specification such that you can just store layers uh, in a compatible way. So you, you, you re reuse so many tools, and that's really awesome. Um, but when we design the manifest, the idea is that, again, the privilege and the requirement and how to use this doc uh, container should be self-documented. It's like syscontrol, right? Like uh, if you're on FreeBSD, syscontrol-d, it tells you what the syscontrol does, right? And if I put in a, a Docker way to say that, okay, I have a Docker image, I can go through the readme file and figure out how to use it, but won't it be nice if it's self-describing, like these are the volumes you're supposed to mount to, like these are the mount points that's supposed to do, they do these kind of things. And I, I think that is like, so, a uh, big requirement, and again, data fast must have it. Like, if I want to have a gel that can do things like open VPN, whatever, I need the tab device. If I need a, I, I have a gel, I want Beehive inside, I need a VMM, like device nodes, they should be there. And they also should tell you, um, yes, we might open these ports, and it should be up to the operator to design if the port forwarding, whatever, should be enabled. Because otherwise, you are injecting some foreign stuff to your system that secretly opening some ports, even if it's only like in its own, like uh, the IP uh, assigned to it. But in, in a production system and like in the, in the cluster, it, there are some serious vulnerabilities. And also, obviously, you need some system IPC, uh, six five IPC, and other attributes because otherwise, Postgres is not going to run. Um, so the way uh, we manage it is that on every single host, there are uh, some host policy, right? So these policies that okay, in general, for these kind of containers, maybe it's mesh by name, maybe it's mesh by prefix. What am I allowed them to do? So let's say you have a containers manifest designed by me, and I'm okay that because I know what it is. So if I'm okay with it uh, opening port 80 and I just redirect it, th that's fine. Then in the host policy, I say, okay, I permit redirect of this uh, equivalent class of, of containers to do these kind of things. Uh, the same thing goes for like um, the uh, man points and everything like that. But if a container is trying to violate that contract, so the con container is saying, yeah, um, actually this container requires opening a port 22 um, and it's self-described there. Basically, runtime catches are like, you, you want to open port 22? And it's like, yeah. And he's like, let, let me ask the guy, right? So, so you provide a way, you still want it to be override, otherwise you have an automated system but never report any failure. And that's the worst kind of automation system ever. So this is like the um, security domain we built in, but what's more interesting is probably the DevFS part. Um, in DevFS, we kind of adopted the idea from all called DJs. There's always some open rules and closed rules. So the idea is that you always need to open something such that PTY, for example, you need to allow people to be able to log in a user shell. But you also have some closed rules. That means like no matter what happened, these device nodes should be hidden. It should never be exposed uh, to this container. Otherwise, uh, we in the container image, you annotate uh, what kind of device node you need, and you just embed it inside. And after all the finalized uh, DataFS rules, that will be all the rules 
are opened and allowed by the holes. And then union with like everything the image is, is requested and want to finalize it, which is like everything the holes want to hide. So uh, the closed rules are ex extremely important because that is like, that's how you configure a system to say there are apps, there's things I absolutely do not want to expose no matter what. For example, you don't want to expose that um, if you're on a NAS, you don't want to expose like the, the uh, block, block device or if it, you are, um, I don't know, what else is uh, cool. Uh, PF ZFS, those, those kind of things are fine because they're general awareness, but there's just so much things you actually want to hide. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Mm -hmm. This one? That's Cayman. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, I don't think you can actually open that Cayman in jail, so yeah. Um, but if whenever a container is like spawned and then you're creating new rules at, that actually become a attack because um, in FreeBSD, the size of uh, DefFS rules are only 16 bits. So it's actually stored as a U32, but 16 bit is used for like um, every single rules in that rule set. And the previous uh, 16 bit is uh, storing the actual rule sets. So you only have around 65K rules sets to work with. And if you keep running a container over and over, by the way, I've seen that in machine learning clusters, people actually like bring up just to run, want to run a one function. It happens, it's crazy. Um, that's for we have like a housekeeping daemon, just keep chapter mapping, say, okay, um, I, okay, I got a hash, so this is how the rule set defined it, like it, it cannot be otherwise, because otherwise the hash will be different, and internally it's mapping to a rule set as a number, so whenever you uh, bring up a new container, what is going on is that, okay, uh, you, you ask for these rules, so I go inside and check, okay, have I already created these rules, if I've already created it, then I can um, mount a rule set on the DevFS of that jail. So this way we have like, um, I think we just close a closed loop because now you can actually have DevFS rule set things that's kind of programmable. You can write it down in the uh, container image and you can distribute it somewhere else when they take it, they actually can run it because the DevFS will be automatically created. Um, Creating image, I think, is going to be a lot similar to what Paul is doing. Uh, currently, because no one actually is going to create image on a UFS node on AWS, that's not for development, that's for running actual stuff. So we only support like um, creating image on ZFS and ABLE node, and we abuse ZFS the hell out of it. Basically, what happened is that every image is going to have some base layers, right? The layers is kind of continuous. So the idea is that um, better apps will look into the data set to say, okay, do I already have a snapshot of this kind of things? If it's no, just keep pulling uh, and stage it. Uh, the way you stage it is just that uh, set up a snapshot, the um, previous one, and then you also cloned it, such that you can work with the file system. And after you work with it, it will get cloned again, and you can use a set as diff to see the changes between your newly created set, uh, data set versus like the previous one and then you get everything that has been changed you bundle them into like a OCI compatible uh, file system layers you upload to any registry you want to do uh, the reason why ZFS div instead of just like div because ZFS div seems to be quite a lot faster than like um, loop, uh, recursively looping every single device uh, sorry files in, um, uh, in a folder per se uh, it's also funny because ZFS div seems to be able to capture some interesting things, for example, uh, the file system flats. But not every programming language, the standard library, actually are aware of the flats. For example, like the uh, no delete flats and all kind of stuff. Um, but I'm glad that TAR captures that because OCI uh, layer files really just TAR with really horrible hack about the whiteout files. That's another story. Um, one very funny thing, as I mentioned before, is that because uh, free B on FreeBSD, gel is a primitive, unlike on Docker, is C groups plus a bunch of stuff, you actually can mount uh, I mean the root file system of a container can live somewhere on NFS. 
So we call that our company also do some live streaming stuff. So one criteria that usually costs a lot of CPU power is that, okay, now let's say a client wants to download the video. We store it as HLS because you want to do live streaming. So what's now? Now you can use Amazon services and the API is horrible and the structure is extremely weird and you can experiment on that and then spend a lot of time and money and frustration with AWS because AWS are horrible um, and get your result back. But what is better is that I can literally just do the same thing with FFmpeg and I guarantee the thing is testable and workable and on every single system and I will know if I switch to uh, Microsoft or I don't know, DigitalOcean one day that the whole thing continues to work. And the best part of it is that you can just use API to bring a 32 coil, 64 coil uh, EC2 instance up. Literally, like in the uh, user group, just ask them to use this um, container over NFS, just do its job, and ask it to queue itself, self destruction. And then now you are only paying uh, the CPU time to transcode this file. You are not paying anything more, anything less. You are not paying for the latency for pulling these. Uh, containers images because it just runs directly over NFS. And it's extremely nice uh, cost-saving and time-saving mechanism because it is much, much cheaper than Lambda, even cheaper than Amazon's own media converting service. Just by having that amount of CPU, just like get it done as soon as possible and die as quickly as possible, it is so viable, it's, we probably save a lot of money just by doing that. Um, and this is also the reason why our um, uh, auto scaling stuff is much simpler because there's just so many things that yeah auto scaling is kind of decide, okay i have a bunch of nodes and how do i load balance all these things but if you have like if you just have like new machine every single time you actually don't need to worry about that in terms of cost you are still using the same amount of cpu time you otherwise will be using anyway so no additional cost at all and this is where my presentation uh, where Keynote um, self-destruct and everything else is gone. <laughs> so, and I have a whole day, full day now, so I was actually drink too much, but any questions so far? Oh, yep. So, you use Unimask. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, yes, Unimask. Uh, do you have some whole story of Unimask? <laughs> There used to be a bug that if a binary is in on the union mount, um, if you try to actually run the binary, the system will panic. But uh, very recently, that bug has been fixed. Uh, but we are also only using well. At that point, we know this will happen, but we're also just using union mounts to mount a var because, like, you always actually need that place to store some state and, and run. Excuse me. But uh, any other state related directory, you, you just now, now mount it, right? And, and that's totally fine. Yep. DNFS mount point read only? Uh, which one? DNFS mount point. Uh, it depends. Um, there's so much horror story. So we usually we want to do it uh, read only, but some language and some weird thing where somehow it, 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 I don't know what it's trying to write. I can probably debug it, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's a container. You already you to it, and um, one additional uh, details on that NFS server, it actually cloned that data set uh, before exporting it. So even if it's read write, there's actually basically no impact at all. Yep. Just make sure you repeat the question during the stream before. Oh, sure. Yep. Uh, Michael, that's not... What was the deal breaker on bus deal for you? Uh, the deal breaker on Busty, uh, first of all, um, ooh, can I rent out a Busty file? I'm going to do it. So the thing about Busty file, it has a lot of directives. Some of it is like limit, and some of it is like a redirect. But here's the thing, when I'm staging a container image, it's supposed to be an image, right? And the image does not set limit on itself. It's supposed a host to set the limit on this container instead of this container is declaring its limit mm -hmm. in terms of computing resources, right? The same thing goes for redirect. Like a container should not decide just redirect its port and do the port forwarding stuff. It should be the, 
the contrary should be the opposite. It's like it's supposed to be the host which owns the entire privilege domain to decide what subset of it it wants to give to this container. It should never be the other way around. And for me, that is like breaking the semantics. Um, if it's like value you say, let's say, let's say uh, if I system decide to put like a bar style uh, on TrueDAS and all of a sudden you are downloading a plugin or like a bar style file that say, hey, uh, can you pop all my, like, uh, put for all my the, the pods to this container, then what are you going to do that? Even what's how you going, you can audit it, but yes, you can do that because you can check the rdr.config, but I just think it's a raw model. And it also should be documented. Yep. Yeah, I think you might be you know, a previous world where you can make a container that's available for use in my infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Dominance is trusted, and in the non the world mm -hmm. that is not the model people use. They have containers that are definitively untrusted and built by um, random people. Mm -hmm. They can't afford to do it. You're totally right. Yep. So the comment is about how uh, in previous world use the usage of container is more about okay, I have infrastructure, I have my, I have my own stuff, and I want to use it. Uh, but on the rest of the world, say Linux. Oh, this is yeah. It's funny because Linux has a historical problem to solve, which is that. Debian, whatever, you have so much dependency, but they're all writing all over the place that you actually can break your system in some really real way. And Docker, in some way, is that when a bunch of developers say, I cannot deal with this anymore, can I just treat my entire environment as one piece, right? But it evolved to a point that, okay, it turns out it's not entirely a bad idea, it becomes like the, the new elf, such that, you know, because dynamic libraries are sometimes interesting and hard. Um, so. It, I have no complaint just like run a run container almost like an application. I do see people run a container, as I mentioned before, as a function or even as a thread that kind of freaked me out. But uh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Yep. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Oh, yep. Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask uh, how. how to look at the stuff exactly you wanted to publish it? Uh, I want to open source it, but I'll, I'll not also want to um, work with um, the base to try to get something that can help everyone. The reason is that our, our thing it sounds cool, but it, it, it's designed to fit our needs, really. And uh, one thing I've seen on GitHub is someone make a kernel module that is really nice. What happened is that when the jail dies, it actually emit a message via DevD. Mm. So it doesn't matter like what you use, you would be able to capture such uh, life cycle events and you can deal with it. And I think like uh, those small things that probably alone cannot solve anyone's problem is going to be a huge lab in terms of like people developing tools that fits for them. Because if you think about container as a monad, like, you know, the, the degrees of freedom is enormous. If you need to develop a tools like orchestration and deal with these degrees of freedom, you have to have the tools also have the same, if not more degrees of freedom. Because mathematically, you cannot just de uh, decrease the degrees of freedom. It it's not possible. You always need something. You always need to make some assumption. Um, but that is also things that make orchestration so hard. Um, so at least if we have some like the life cycle su uh, support in the base, that would be really awesome. If we have some same like a uh, stacking filing system, then it would be awesome because overlay two is pretty nice. It, it does it by the way that when you mount it, uh, uh, where you mounting from will become read only. They, they, they work around a lot of issues by doing that. Um, it, just, it just turns out like in the container world, um, the storage actually sometimes become problems. So these like, um, um, layering file system actually have a working one actually will help. Uh, Union FS, I, I can run VAR over it, I, I don't have issue. Am I going to run a jail over it? I probably won't do that. So that's, yeah, that's my take on it. Yep. When you mentioned briefly that you publish your images to mm -hmm. like some sort of container registry. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like what format you use and... Ooh, you use yes. Um, yep. Uh, so as long as you, you actually make the layer, right? You can do whatever you want to do with it. But the layer itself is just a tar file with very bad white file files workaround that actually is designed to fit the Linux 
uh, how, how overlay to uh, like do things. So what happens is that you literally have a tar file, right? Inside is every single file that you change. Obviously, if you update it, it's going to copy the entire thing, which is the right thing to do. But let's say if you remove some file from the upper layer, right? The way they do that is that they append a file that prefix with dot wh dot, and then the and then the file name. So that means you're supposed to delete that file uh, from this path prior you extracting it, right? So uh, the way I work around it because I'm kind of OCD is that I write uh, utilities in, in Rust. Uh, what it does is that it will go through the tar header. And if it sees a file that starts with dot, wh dot, which is horrible because tar actually is not tar. Tar actually is, is pax and tar combined. So handling file is a little bit interesting, but what it does basically is go through the tar blocks and if it sees a write file, it will delete it. Otherwise, it will just pass through underlying uh, tar to extract, continually extract the um, distribution. But when you're creating it, you, you have to think about that. And you have to also, uh, from set of uh, diff, you look at uh, what kind of files has already been, already been deleted, and then you need to write uh, at these uh, write out files back. Mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, ZFS diff is only a best effort tool. So there are corner cases where ZFS can't tell you which files have been modified and just shows the oh. question mark as part. Uh, if it's question mark, just copy it. Like, if I, I'm not sure what's going on, then, the, the, then you know, the most safe way is just copy it. But so far, I don't think I have encountered any issue uh, with that. Any other questions? Yep. This would have been interesting. Uh, in... Mm -hmm. uh, okay, pardon? I'm not quite understanding the question. So, how, how well would this work? in a BSD-based container infrastructure as well as a Linux container infrastructure. Ooh. If I've got multiple mm -hmm. container pods, yes. like this, et cetera, mm -hmm. how can I have a single pane that's manageable? I see. So the idea is uh, about the, I think my question is like the performance and also can you have a single tube to manage everything at once? So you want that uh, Kubernetes as horrible as it, it, as it is, actually can work in this scenario because how it works is just exposing an API endpoint for you uh, to do a bunch of stuff. It doesn't really care like how like it spawn up the port. So technically you can have FreeBSD as a port or the other around which is that FreeBSD running, uh, you have like Linux compatible jails and then try to behave like Linux that also works. Um, in terms of performance impact, uh, it depends on your workload, really. If, if your original binary is, got, is really slow on FreeBSD, it's going to be really slow when you run it un, uh, inside a jail. But otherwise, a jail is really just a process and then with an, like a structure pointing to a, a, a jail there, so there's no realistic performance difference. Um, but I think, I'm not an expert on that, don't put me on that, but I think using um, serverless uh, backed uh, container, I believe it should be able to uh, have some performance. Um, yeah, maybe not, but, but yeah, it should have some performance improvement because you're actually referencing the same node. So I guess that could work well um, with the file cache. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm just guessing. Any more questions? Yeah, I think that's it then.